Good evening, everyone. I'm Charlie Kyle, the principal of Venice College. Welcome to tonight's Canadian Film Forum screening of Achilles Escape. Before we begin, I will start with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work and celebrate on this land. It gives me great pleasure to say that tonight's screening is Achilles Escape, and we will have with us the director, Charles Officer, and the moderator, Yasmin Kanji. Uh, both of them will be present for the Q&A after the screening ends, and the screening will take about 90 minutes. So buckle up and enjoy the film, and then please come back and join us for a Q&A with Charles Officer, moderated by Yasmin Kanji. Enjoy the film. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, in a moment, we'll meet with the director of and the writer of the film you just saw, Kila's Escape, Charles Officer. Charles has been with us before at the Canadian Film Forum back several years ago now uh, with Unarmed Verses. Um, and uh, he's a man of the moment because you, if you're not watching it, you probably will be very soon. CBC's The Porter, and Charles is the director of several of those episodes. So very happy to have him here tonight. Um, and introducing him and moderating the session will be Yasmin Kanji, who is someone I've known for several years now. She's an Innes alumna, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. So Yasmin is a TIFF Next Wave filmmaker, Hot Docs Accelerator Fellow, and the founder of the advocacy and consulting organization Films with a Cause. In 2020, she graduated from the University of Toronto as a Dean Scholar with a double major in Peace, Conflict and Justice Studies from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Critical Studies of Equity and Solidarity with a minor in Cinema Studies. Her first film, From Syria to Hope in 2019, was awarded Best Documentary at the Toronto Short Film Festival of that year. Yasmin's first funded film, With Love from Munera, premiered at the 2020 Inside Out Film Festival, screened at TIFF Next Wave 2021, and the 2021 Toronto International Real Asian Film Festival. And it won the 2021 Breakthroughs Film Festival Audience Choice Award. She is in development on her first feature film about a sickle cell disease activist stem cell transplant journey, funded by the Hot Docs Cross Currents Fund, executive produced by none other than Charles Officer and Jake Janowski which she is pitching at the 2022 European Film Market in Berlin through the Doc Toolbox program. Yasmin acts as a social media manager on the highly anticipated CBC and BET series, The Porter, which I just mentioned, and is spearheading the marketing campaign for the CBC gem series, Zarka, produced by the creators of Little Mosque on the Prairie. Yasmin currently works at Charles Officer's production company and supports Oscar nominee Sammy Khan's projects while working in different capacities on Toronto-based Productions. So, welcome to Canadian Film Forum, Yasmin. I know you're no uh, stranger to uh, Innes's events, but we're happy to have you here. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because I was uh, always attending all of these uh, screenings, actually. So it's uh, it's interesting to be on the other side. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here um, and to be introducing Charles Officer. So Charles is the founder and creative director of the Toronto-based production company, Cane Sugar Filmworks. A former professional hockey player, Charles studied design at Ontario College of Art and worked as a creative director before studying theater at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York. He's an alumni director resident at the Canadian Film Centre where his debut feature, Nurse Fighter Boy, was produced. The film premiered at TIFF in 2008 and earned a record 10 Genie nominations for a debut film. His featured doc, Mighty Jerome, is a breathtaking rendering of the rise and fall of Harry Jerome, Canada's greatest unsung track and field star. Produced by the National Film Board, the film premiered at Hot Docs 2011 and won multiple awards, including the 2012 Emmy Award for Best Historical Doc. Charles Feature Documentary, Unarmed Verses, premiered in 2017 and won Best Canadian Feature Awards at Hot Docs, Vancouver International Film Festival and TIFF Top 10 Festival. That same year, The Skin We're In, 
a television doc that examines anti-Black racism through the perspective of journalist and activist Desmond Cole, received a CSA Donald Britton Award nomination for Best Social Political Documentary. His feature documentary, Invisible Essence, The Little Prince, is an authorized work about Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's transcendent novella, Le Petit Prince. Released in 2018, the film was sold internationally to Netflix and received two CSA nominations for Best Feature Documentary and Best Editing. Charles' work has also crossed multiple television series such as Corner, 21 Thunder, and the forthcoming, now premiering a, a 1920s drama, The Porter. His latest feature, A Killer's Escape, premiered at TIFF 2020 and won five CSA awards, including Best Original Screenplay in 2021. The Crime Noir chronicles the, po the politics of generational violence and features acclaimed poet and actor Saul Williams and original music by Massive Attack. Charles is an advocate for diverse creators and Black representation in the arts. He is a founding member of Canada's first Black Screen Office and serves as Board of Trustees for the AGO, Real Canada, and the Glenbow Glen Museum. Hello, Charles. <laughs> hello, Yasmin. Hi. <laughs> hi, and hi Charlie, and, and hello um, in this town hall, folks, and anyone who's tuning in. Hi, it's, it's kind of cool to, to connect with you because this is where I actually met you. Yes, I know, <laughs> 2018. It was February of 2018. So that would have been like four years ago when Unarmed Versus was screening when we got to be in person at Innes. Exactly. And we met and uh, and then we eventually started working together. So that's, it's, it's, uh, these things are, are, are special. So yeah, really well, cool to be back. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. totally. Yeah, but it was it was also just such a privilege to be able to watch you direct um, on set of Achilles Escape, and that was just such a special journey to witness. So I'm I'm really grateful to have had that opportunity. Um, and I'm wondering, looking back, if there is a standout scene that either there was maybe something that you were especially looking forward to shooting, or some a scene that you were particularly nervous about, um, and if you would like to speak to that. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, and you did some great um, behind the scenes work uh, during that shoot. And uh, we, you know, the film we shot, as you know, not everyone else knows what we shot. It's set at night, so we shot a lot of nights um, <coughs> into, <coughs> into very early hours. And, uh, and you were there, so I, I'll never forget that. And I appreciate that. Um, I would say it was uh, the scene that I was most terrified about um was a finale was the climax um and the shootout and how that was gonna you know unfold i had so many um you know i, I must have mapped out that scene in in five different ways you know um and not that i am these individuals but i did like the scorsese version i did like the michael mann version i did like the terrence malick version i did like the spike lee version i did like you know uh what would david duvarnay do with it like you know um and then just in terms of influences but it was it was it was it was it terrified me because it was uh it was scripted as an extremely violent scene and, and I'm very anti-gun and, uh, and, you know, there's a seduction of, of, um, of trying to uh, sensationalize something for what you think the audience or what a distributor or what people uh, will attach um, their ideas about an action film or, or uh, a thriller is. Um, and I had to actually, you know, right up into, I think, seriously, probably four days before we shot the scene where I was just scrambling through it. And, and, uh, uh, Jeff Bronwell, who was the first AD, who we, you know, we, we were like together at the hip, like throughout the whole production and every day and just downloading to him what I'm thinking. And I remember I had a, a, a dream or something vision, like a couple of nights, before shooting it and, 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 and it all shifted into a point of, point of view. And, um, and, and when I explained it to him, he was really excited about it, but I still didn't know if it would work because there's, it's almost like, you know, you can, you can shoot a scene in a way and get all the things even you don't think you may need 
just be safe or you can make bold choices and say, I'm only going for this and I'm going to spend time doing this. And it was chaotic and we didn't have a lot of time and we had to shoot it before the sun came up. Uh, sort of, we, so the, the light and the natural time that we had dictated how much time I actually had to shoot it, no matter if it really would have taken, you know, two hours longer. I only had that time. So I would say that, yeah, the, the, the finale scene was, scared me the most. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, so, so, <laughs> so to answer that question, there were a few that also, um, uh, that were, um, I don't know, challenging also because of just maybe the emotional state mm -hmm. of the scenes. Um, but I was excited about the scene and also emotionally, it may seem small, but it was just a moment where, where young, young Akilah finds his mother after he's woken up and she's cleaning up and they have this little, very, this tender conversation. And, um, and it was also because it was such a personal scene for me, like, uh, you know, a personal experience that I was also uh, uh, exercising. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so those are probably the two ones that stand out. Mm -hmm. how, how do you keep your, you know, composition when you're shooting scenes that are so personal to you? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's, it's funny, there's like, when you're sitting there and you're watching the scene, there's the exterior that people see of you, how you're responding to something. And then you have your interior. Very of calm. You seem very <laughs> calm throughout all of the long nights and I was, I was impressed, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't really so. <laughs> it was like, it was like, yeah, like there were moments where it's so funny. It's like, uh, I'm there and I'm in this scene and then I don't know, like crew is doing something or this or that. And I was, something was happening that was distracting me. And I was like, uh, in my in, in my body, I'm just like, ah, just everyone be quiet. This is so this this is so personal. This is so intimate. Mm -hmm. And then you know, and this is what I love about Jeff is that he caught on to that, mm -hmm. and then he actually as AD, and then he kind of said something, and he came over. And he goes, "No, bro, I, I know how important this one is to you. It's like it's probably your mom, right? <laughs> like you know, he was just so he was just so tapped into it. But but yeah, it's uh, it's constantly I think. Um, understanding that again, you know, as much as the director, you need to focus and, 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 and stuff. It's just being sure that the actors have the space to, to actually, um, to sink into those emotional moments as well. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, it's, uh, just constantly the face that you're showing that it doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't really express what's going on inside. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have known. You seemed very composed through some very stressful moments. So that was, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I remember it so well. But um, so in talking about the story and why it was important for you to tell, um, I'm interested in why you wanted to represent this story through the parallel characters of Akilah and Shepard. Hmm. It was it was really the whole impetus of it came from this feeling of, of um, you know, there's this larger force, uh, you know, uh, violence, and then how politics plays into it and how it generationally moves, um, you know, from a grandfather to the grandson, to the son, to the child, to the, like, it just, there's this lineage of it. And, um, and I think that it was uh, it was really it was really this this question that I had about the cost, you know, what does it cost to try to escape this cycle? What does it cost um, to to circumvent or to um, put an end to um, this trauma? And what sacrifices have to happen along the way? And when I think of, you know, youth and young men, young black men um, and our, you know, the teachings and the environment and not that they're all like this, but I'm just saying I'm speaking to something specific. It's, it's, it's where, where, who, the question was like, how does, how does, how do we allow our youth to, to, to succumb to that? 
as men, as we get older, understanding that, who does the onus stand um, on the shoulders of? Um, so, you know, do a lot of work um, at the time and, and over the years with youth. And, and there's this, this question that I had of, around like, what is, what good is, is, is an art program or this sort of thing if, if these living conditions put people in, in desperate situations? Um, and where, where do the men in the community who see this, understand it, have may have lived it, when do they choose to guide the young men in a way, on a path that is, that is away from the path they've taken? And, and this is a sort of perpetual cycle of, 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 um, of what we pass down generationally. And, and, and so I want to, you know, to make this film with, with, w that showed the parallel of, of what this youth, this man, what he experienced as a boy and what would happen now that, you know, he's a man has, having escaped it, quote unquote himself, if he would confront someone that was just in the like, in, 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 the, in the spirit of himself. So it was almost like um, this metaphor of, of self that we are all, you know, children, we are all, you know, become adolescents, we become adults. And at what point along the way do you actually see yourself in the youth that you're, that you, that you may guide and, and what choice will you make? And, and with Akila, it's, it's, it's a, it's kind of like this uh, coming of age story, but, but also a reckoning story because, you know, when he had to escape at a young age and we don't really tell the story on camera, but he was orphaned, he was exiled and had to fend for himself at like, you know, for, as a young teenager um, and leave his home. And, and so, so his, childhood is was robbed from him you know um and it was a different kind of level of, of responsibility that i think he carried into manhood that didn't make him um also bitter it, it put him in a, in a space of uh of solitude but um and and uh but when he recognized this young boy um in a similar situation that he's experienced it wasn't lost on him to know that there is another way. And, um, and so it was important for me to show those parallels. And there was a period even in the writing where, where um, <laughs> I was really playing with the structure of it. And I think it was like the half of the film, you were just with young Akila. And then suddenly halfway through the film, like boom, he's a man. And that's when the other things started to happen. And he met this boy and, and, um, but it was it was important for me to try to um, make these connections of of of, uh, of of the past of this of young Kila, his experiences that shaped him as a man, um, and then seeing this young boy who's basically who who was just primed to he can go any way either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I remember I talked to Vic because I kind of had a little moment with each of the cast members. Um, me and Vic had a conversation about toxic masculinity and mm -hmm. about um, how that kind of played into a lot of his kind of personal development. So I'm wondering like what kind of conversations went on in, in preparation for like Saul and, and Tamela and Vic when it, when it came to that. Yeah, like, I mean, as... Black men who, you know, live in the North Americas, we, we, we often, I mean, we would have conversations, Sauls and, and Vic are different kind of individuals that would have conversations about, about this sort of thing independently of, of the film, um, which I think is the con conversations that I, why I wanted him so much to be in the film, because he was so aware of masculinity, femininity, the, you know, people who front from the streets, the, the culture, you know, he, he understood it on a level that, that uh, was truly human and nuanced and, and there was an empathy 
and a compassion and a, and a way and a point of view that he just naturally has. And I think that Vic was mentored a lot by Saul growing up as a, as a musician, as an artist. So um, our conversations about that, you know, were happening on the stoops in New York when we just hang out over the years. But through the film, it was really specific in terms of, of Akilah's, Akila in this place where he's 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 witnessed it, he was raised around it, and he knows that it actually exists in him. And that's the awareness that he has. It's that it's when you are believing that you're not or you're exempt of it, or that you don't have those those tendencies at times as men when we're putting positions to prove ourselves or to man up or to perpetuate a certain sort of masculinity that is, that is, that, that is toxic. So I think that we, we want to talk about, you know, the evolution of Akila through even the literature that he read and that we indicated in the book from, you know, the art of war to the Iliad. And then like, you know, um, reading a book by James Baldwin, who, where this is the last book that he finds as a young man, as a teenager. And then we meet him, you know, in the chronology as, as, as a grown man, but that's where the idea of masculinity and, and, and manhood and, and, and your place in it kind of galvanizes for him. So, so, so it's, these sort of questions are things that we actually naturally have in our lives. And he was very, very open and and um, and interested in, in that the fact that we were going to explore that in this film, um, and not in this sort of you know heavy-handed way of talking about it because it's it's it is it is it is somehow more perpetuated in, in in development of of young men's DNA than 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 any other thing. You know, um, and and they may seem slight and 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 harmless, but as young boys are are being nurtured how to how to how to function in this world, it's really you know there's some old school ways that 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 are still obviously prevalent and alive. Um, I call them old school because they feel you know they feel like they need to be put to, put away. You know, um, and I think that uh, there's another level, there's another layer. And also being a male, I want to actually represent properly, right? And want other men too. So there's, the conversations were really strong. And, and, and it was wonderful because young Tamela, who, who plays Shepherd and young Akila, is a young man who has a certain sensitivity in his soul. So, so also having him around someone like Saul, um, and Vic and some of the other cast members and Olunuke and Ronnie Rowe and, and these individuals to show that even in the work of it, that in real life that he has these examples that he can actually lean on and watch and observe how they move, you know? Yeah, that was really interesting. In a couple of moments, I, I caught Tamela and, and I, I could see the excitement just around being able to to you know, be in Saul's presence and, and see that, that those interactions between them um, was really special. So when it comes to the, the women and the performances of the women, so Alanuke and Denisha, um, can you speak a little bit to what their characters and what their performances brought to the story in the film? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Alanuke being, you know, Akila's mother, I think she, you know, she she has very specific moments in the in in the film, and and I think her essence and her example is is what I think really lands with Akila and, and kind of um, points to the kind of man man that she 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 wishes him to be. She hopes that he can be, and without actually you know completely like you know father bashing you know she's still holding this sort of place where being able to identify this is what your father's experience has been and this is the product of it now that you see that you can actually take a different path like and and how you know 
that that female experience and 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 that sort of um, love that he experiences from her is something that he he fights for. He he um, it actually is what puts him in the in the place of the choices that he makes as a man when he meets you know Faye when he feeds um, uh, Shepherd's aunt. It, so for me, you know, they're they're not saintly, but they're saintly or this sort of place. They're three dimensional. They're real, but they're um, they're anchors. You know, um, they're the soul uh, in the chaos, but they're ready to fight. They're ready to stand up. They're ready to do what they need to do um, for their loved ones. And and um, and I and and through this sort of story that I was specifically talking about. It's, it's like, you know, um, that role of, of these women, um, and I'm just going to flip over to Faye is that, you know, it may seem so on the nose, all this stuff, but she works at the hospital. It's something very, very normal in black culture and <laughs> women around my world, the nurses and stuff, but she's a caregiver, you know, She's taken in her nephew who lost his mother and had nowhere to go and had to come to Canada. And um, she looks after him, his guardian. She's there to protect him. And, um, and she, she, she's aware that she can only do so much, but she's willing to go there, you know? And, um, and, and for Shepard, it's, it's, um, you know, that's without, if without this woman, I mean, this boy, even in this story, if she hadn't, you know, tried to call or try something and someone onto to Kila or, or something, I mean, you know, she never would have, she would never see her nephew again. And so, so I think that she is, um, they're very reflective of actually women in my world as well. And, um, and and yeah, and they represent. They just represent the the anchor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in bringing that, you know, experience of you know just just your world and bringing so much of your world into Akila, um, how did how did your Jamaican roots play a part in this film? And and how did you bring bring all of these elements in for for your background into the film? Yeah, um, great question. Um, and also, I also want to mention that I uh, co-writer uh, Wendy Motion Brathwaite. Like she was very instrumental in in, in developing. Um, she came on a little bit later into this process, like as I was writing and working, and then gone to this place. And and um, I knew that I, you know, she understood everything about this world: the men, the women, the culture, the everything. And so, um, and coming from theater, I was really keen on her breaking into film and television. And, and, and so we, we had numerous conversations and, and sat down with things a lot. And, um, and our Caribbean roots, roots, you know, also grew up in Toronto. Like it's, it's funny. It's like, we, you know, I'm Jamaican. She's not, but she's been around a lot of Jamaicans and I've been around a lot of Guyanese and Trinis and Bayesians and, and stuff. So, so um, we're able to, and we know about parts of the stories, but the impetus for me was really looking at, you know, um, it was in 2010 um, and I'd always been curious and, and, you know, stories and myths and throughout my family and, um, around the shower posse and this, this organization and historically and how, you know, political factions in Jamaica were really tied in to um, criminal activity organizations and empowering and uh, how we control communities and votes and, and it's, it's, it's enforcers and all this stuff. And, you know, around 2010, there was a big, big, um, uh, situation that happened where that is Coke was, was, uh, was, uh, the authorities were after him in America. They want to extradite, extradite him. And, 
it was believed that he was hiding out in Tivoli Garden in Jamaica and, you know, security forces went in and over the course of like 40 hours, it was just, just the most horrendous violence took place in this in here. And, um, and I want to talk about it. I wanted to uh, draw a connection to what was happening on that scale uh, where people get sensationalized and believe, oh, wow, this gangs is high now and blah, 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 blah. But when you peel back the layers and you keep looking back at the history, you're looking at how these things came to be, who was involved. And um, that connects to when we're seeing, you know, on the six o'clock news in Toronto, this young black boy's face and everyone just sees this face and, and this idea and not really understanding and, and, and there's no way that I can make this known to everybody, but there's this whole lineage to this young boy that you're watching on six o'clock news right now mm-hmm. that is deeper and that comes from a spawning of political corruption that leads into poverty, that leads into desperation, that leads into gang culture. So it's like, you know, it was important for me to, at least put it out there and maybe people don't want me to do this, but fictionalizing and trying to show that there is, whether people care or not for myself, I do that, that there's a bigger picture at play when we're talking about urban violence and that, um, you know, when I hear, you know, our mayor or someone talking about individuals or a situation and thinking that, you know, solve the problem is is spending another you know 10 million dollars to put another like 20 police officers on the street it's 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 not the answer and so there's there's corruption in in all these levels of of authority that i think you know um that goes unscathed and the I'm being sarcastic, but the beneficiaries of all that are these young boys who who get incarcerated, lose their lives, um, hurt other people, have access to 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 weapons um, easier than they can get a driver's license. Like it's like there's a real problem, and and I'm putting it back to our our political uh, uh, bodies that. Um, and our people who are manning our borders and, you know, where people who are worried about driving across the border and, 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 and not being vaccinated, but we have weapons and we have very, very harmful things that are being, um, you know, smuggled into our, into the hands of young people. So anyway, I just, I just felt like my roots and where I grew up in Toronto from the images I've seen as a kid, as young Black boys on the cover of newspapers to the, the, the immediate response and impressions of them to um, understanding what, you know, um, this island and this place that I have cultural roots to and how beautiful and wonderful and vibrant and amazing it is and understanding the political corruption in there, how it's really uh, torn a country apart. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, before I get to my next question, if anyone has any any questions they'd like to ask, feel free to drop them in the Vimeo chat. Um, so I remember being at the TIFF premiere and all of the excitement from the cast and crew and everyone who was able to finally, you know, see the film in person. Um, what have been some of the most rewarding aspects for you since that moment um, of being able to see how the film has resonated? Yeah, I think um, it's been we- it's been very interesting. This film coming out, and then we're in this pandemic, and it's a different sort of rhythm. So, in a way, it's been very isolating, but also joyful. I think I think um, you know, I've been able to go to any phys- festivals other than TIFF. That one, you know, we've been able to play from Shanghai to other places, and I, you know, um, and. But I w- I'll say I was very surprised. I remember, like, we're I was in Winnipeg and we're location scouting, and the CSAs are going on, and I have no idea what's happening, and I'm just getting notes from from Jake. Oh my God, this! And I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, he's like, we got another one. Got another. I'm like, what? got what? Um, and then I and then eventually I called him in between, and he's like telling me what's happening and 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 I felt 
you know, I, I was number one, really excited that Ronnie Rowe got nominated, like Tamela, uh, Saul Williams for these roles, um, you know, um, you know, Nicole Hilliard Ford for casting. Like, it's because people don't know, like, like they'll see the name of the cast, but I know what she did, you know, how much time she spent, how many conversations we had, where did she look, like what she did. And, and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful when individuals get recognized. And that's kind of the most satisfying thing for me is when, you know, you try to, you know, you have this blank canvas, you have an idea, you start to fill this canvas and, and individuals get to touch it. And hopefully that they feel like they, they've really um, contributed to something and, and enjoyed it. And um, that somehow that they're rewarded from it, you know, in some way, some recognition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have one audience question. Um, so it's from uh, Jacob Brooks. Hi, Charles. I love the film and was particularly struck by the use of color and the climactic scene. The characters and setting are bathed in red. I was wondering how you thought about color as, as, as symbolic in the film. Yeah, great question. Um, I really love uh, using color in a way that is such um, psych psychological, emotional, um, and sometimes, you know, just instinctual. I think with Maya Bankovic, our, our cinematographer, we spoke a lot about color palettes and how we're going to approach things. And um, she never shut me down when I threw out some ideas. Like, you know, I see a neon light in Akila's apartment, and it's and it's and it's pink, <laughs> and 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 it's. Uh, she didn't say like, "What are you talking about?" And I and then I would talk about like why. And for example. You know, <clears throat> and it's and it's again, it's just like I'm these ideas that you just poke poke fun at as well. It's just like these ideas that you know, blues for girls, pinks for boys. Like, you know, a gangster. Why would he ever have like we're going to bathe it in this sort of like you know, these sort of tough colors and and uh, or this this vibe. And it's and you know, he's a human being who likes things and you know, and in his personality. It's not me imposing that stuff. It's yes, I'm thinking of the various ways that someone can use light in their own spaces that makes it feel like, you know, yes, I thought of it, but it's in the film. Like it's, it's, that's Akilah's light, you know? Um, but uh, when we're looking at the atmospheres, like when, you know, the, the climax scene and and in the in the in the or the shipping containers in the shipping yard and and stuff there's there was something that I really imagined about how it was tonally um um in this sort of sodium -y vapor vibe um at night and then you know and then eventually we'd come through it and our color would actually change and uh, into this new day and 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 I love the idea of of um, of playing with color like even you know with our with our flashbacks and some of these when we move to um, these moments um, when a young Akilah is around we we focus on keeping colors quite warm um, and although that those were the moments where there were actually like you know more little violent moments um, yeah, I think color is something when I was, you know, uh, went to OCAD and was a designer, I think I learned that, you know, um, I mean, we, we all know that we're affected by different colors. And, um, and I tried to actually create, uh, map out a bit of a palette, you know, um, which will affect your wardrobe decisions, which will affect you know, kind of even the lenses you're using. Um, and so, so there's, a, there was a rhythm to it, but it was all very much also based around when you go into a location and you are imagining how to utilize a space. Um, I try to actually take inspiration from the space as well. And sometimes initially, if the space doesn't feel right in its color vibe, although we're going to dress it and stuff and we're going to change it in, in some places, um, that is also very, very influential in, in, in locations 
With this project, it was a little different because we had very few dollars to spread amongst a lot of various locations. We had a lot of locations. So a lot of it was kind of remanufactured in studio where we had an opportunity with our production designer, Diana Batangelo, to to actually really look at stuff and 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 try to paint things and find the colors and and we do this as a team too. It's not like I I kind of talk about these ideas or things and and Maya would say things and Diana would say things and we we try to find a, a palette that works uh, for the for for the for the entire film. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. So um, Post Office Creative, which I want to assume is Gabe. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hi, Charles. Great film. Were, were there any pleasant surprises during production? Um, if so, how did it impact the film? Um, man, uh, surprises. Oh, gosh. I think I was just surprised like every day, um, either from a performance or either from, you know, something that kind of, you know, you plan things in the blocking and then some little thing will sometimes show up. Sometimes a thing will go wrong too. And that's also a surprise. Um, man, cause you know, we shot this film in 2019. So, uh, um, you know what, actually I was surprised as a bit of a joke. I was surprised how well Saul drove that VW <laughs> van <laughs> because it was thick it was clunky at times it, you know, we had to take it around and I had to take him down on the, uh, on the, um, on the gardener as well. And man, uh, I, yeah, this isn't the answer you're probably looking for, but I was surprised of how quickly he maneuvered out of me instructing him to go the wrong way at around four in the morning on the gardener expressway. And, um, yeah, like like an accident really could have happened. <laughs> um, but uh, surprisingly, he responded really, really well and quickly. And because he's American, he doesn't drive up here. And uh, um, and uh, and it was um, yeah, that was a, that was a surprising moment because I was surprised myself that I gave him the wrong direction being from here, how to turn and an, and I've driven this route all the time. And, uh, but he compensated. So I'm sorry that wasn't a really good answer, but. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that was a fun answer. It's all good. Um, so I guess that's kind of all the time that we have. So this is really fun. And thank you so much for coming back to Innis. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Charlie. Hey, Charles. Hey, Charlie. How are you? Good. I'll just, I'm going to squeeze in uh, my own question, which is not so much about this film, but this film in relation to the latest project you've been involved with that's now out there, which is The Porter. Yeah. And just how you, how you made the shift to uh, filming something that involved a lot of period details that where there's going to be a lot of attentiveness to getting that, that kind of that feel of a different era, right? And how, how you as a director sort of responded to those, those new challenges. Yeah, it was um, it was uh, a big challenge. The Porter is, um, I mean, for everyone that was involved in that, the project, it's it was a it was a huge and new undertaking. Um, I had been sort of peripherally involved in the project for a few years. Um, now, when it became real, I, I, you know, I really did a lot of homework and research, <laughs> and. Um, and, and again, you, this is the beautiful thing about these projects is that, yes, I directed, you know, this pilot episode and the first and first couple and, and, and four out of the eight and, and, and kind of you, you're, you're, you're kind of tasked with kind of that, you know, being the first. <laughs> so there is, um, we have amazing teams that we pull together where, you know, from our production designer, our costume designers, our, you know, um, our cinematographer, Jordan Oram, who, who had never shot television before. So he, he was actually, you know, um, coming from indie feature and he'd done one large studio film and had never shot a television series before. So a lot of us were, were tasked, I've shot television before, but never set in 1920 and, 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 and all the stuff. And, 
And I think it's like, you know, I, like how you prepare for an exam or you prepare for a test or you prepare, you know, to defend your thesis, you, you, you have to do a lot of homework. You have to stay up extra late. You have to read a lot. You have to watch a lot. Um, we put together um, documents and, and things and, 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 and clips of shows we liked and things we didn't like, things to avoid, things that we want to go strive for. And, um, and pulling like so many references, like I, you know, pulled references from, from great, like, you know, uh, period photographers, um, uh, Gorm Parks, uh, uh, Ray uh, de Cavara, like there was a whole bunch of um, uh, materials that we pulled, um, but that doesn't, you can pull them to your, but then you have to deal with the days and you have to deal with the practical. And, you know, there's a lot of individuals around and, but our teams were incredible because, you know, even when we're setting up our production office, you can go down to the departments and see the material and the research that they pulled. And you can ask these questions and, um, you know, you do your homework, they do theirs and you, and you try to find that sort of space. So, it was nerve wracking, Charlie. Like it was, it was huge because there's, there's a lot of expectation. There's a lot of funds being put in towards this, uh, this, this, this project. It has been done before. Uh, it's a black creative team where it's like, you know, um, people have their, eye, I believe people have their eye on us <laughs> in a certain way. Um, there, you know, um, there's a lot of noise to kill and there's a lot of, things to hold on to, to actually keep you sharp and keep you um, really attentive to, to try and do your best, you know, finding, you know, um, uh, um, someone who can, a dialect coach for the actors and finding the right person and setting up those meetings and, you know, um, making sure there's an acting coach for the, for this young boy who doesn't speak in the whole show. Um, who's a young actor who, is a really young actor who doesn't have the kind of screen experience. How do you prepare for all these things? Um, there's so many um, variables that you just kind of have to try your best to stay on top of. Um, and then eventually when you hit the ground, um, it doesn't stop. It's, 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 you're still every day just trying to um, rec regroup and, and, and look at what you did well, what you didn't do well, how we need to fix some things. And, and, uh, but it, it was a monster. And we, these sort of things don't happen without assembling um, a great team. Well, I'd say you met the challenge based on the reviews I've read because it's getting rave reviews. You must feel good about that. And let's hope that translates into a large audience for it. Um, before, before I do our sort of lead out, um, tell the audience a bit more about what we can expect from you. The next thing that's going to hit a screen, uh, ideally that we'll be able to show at the Canadian film forum again. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about it. I was um, asked to reimagine a film that was actually uh, very, very influ influential to me when I was uh, a young hockey player. Um, There's a film that was made in the 80s called Young Blood, and it starred like Patrick Swayze and Rob Lowe. <laughs> and, gonna say Rob Lowe. <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds crazy that like you're like, Charles, but you do this stuff. Why would you? <laughs> um, but what I pitched is, uh, is, uh, is, um, it's a player, a hockey player of color, and, uh, and, um, and, and I'm flipping a bit of the, uh, the ideals in it, um, in terms of this question of uh, what, what uh, you know, Yasmin has brought up around the toxic masculinity of talking about hockey culture and how this culture does need a shift. The original um, Youngblood was about a, a player who was quick and skilled and little, who had to like learn how to fight, you know, fight the guy and be like, you know, the hockey fighter my player already knows how to fight. <laughs> so it's not that he has to learn. He, he has to learn when to fight and what is it about his masculine and um, his, how he's been nurtured as a hockey player up to this young point of his career of his life, what he has to let go of and what culture he has to build for himself moving forward to be on the other side of, of, of what we've been seeing coming out of this sport. Um, uh, a new, a new generation of athlete is where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, 
try to steer the story towards that. Um, and, uh, and how to, and how that is a heartbreaking thing because, you know, uh, in hockey and in sports, sometimes, you know, with this particular story, his father was very, very heavy handed into his development and partially really instrumental in parts of his success. But there's a period where his father's ways and his cultural perspective isn't going to help him anymore. And there's actually a, a heartbreaking severance of father, son, in order to him to to move forward, he has to let his father go, um, and uh, and and that is that is the emotional sort of um, uh, journey for this character as he is of color in a world where where you know not many black hockey players have been um, welcomed or or have you know been very successful. So um, just kind of shifting the perspective uh, of of what this game is and and. And uh, because, you know, we look back into the late 1800s, there was, um, you know, the first colored hockey league before the, you know, the National Hockey League came into play um, right here in the East Coast of Canada, where it was organized hockey. So um, there is a lineage to the game for uh, for people of color um, and our indigenous uh, peoples who made those hockey sticks um, um, that uh, that I want to kind of point to. And, and try to bring, I'm not going to suck all the fun out of young blood, but I'm, I am going to uh, juice it up with some things to think about. Great. Great. Well, thank you uh, for telling us that. And again, I hope we get to show it when it's, uh, when it's out. I and so. I, ideally, maybe <laughs> in person. Um, and anyway, thank you so much for Aquila's escape. Thank you for uh, talking with Yasmin. Yasmin, thank you for your moderation. Thanks to the whole crew um at Innes who helped to put this together i'm just going to let people know about three more events we have coming up uh on february 28th which is just monday i mean it's a literally around the weekly corner we have beyond moving uh with the director vikram dasgupta and the subject cpa november will also be uh well i say present in quotation marks because it will of course be a virtual event and that will be the final of our three uh black history month events and then on thursday march 10th we will have a screening of night raiders with the director denny goulet and then thursday march 17th one week after march 10th isn't it yeah we'll have the many saints of newark with the director alan taylor for those of you who may not know that's the prequel to the sopranos so lots to look forward to and thank you for coming and joining us tonight and hope you'll be with us again on Monday. Okay. Good night, everyone.